copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles police calling all cars. Attention all cars broadcast 148. A woman found murdered in her office in the Dillman building. Be on the lookout for suspicious Negroes. That's all. Rolls and quest. Sensational popularity of this radio program, Calling All Cars, has developed a host of imitators. The sensational increase in the sale of Rio Grande cracked gasoline, which has outstripped all competitors in percentage of sales increase, has brought out many imitators. Perhaps you have seen or heard statements that other brands of gasoline are guaranteed to meet government emergency specifications and are used in police cars, fire engines, and emergency equipment. Let us reassure you right now that Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline is the only gasoline in this market refined by the exclusive patented Sinclair cracking process, which is admitted by experts to be the last word in refining. And we challenge anyone to disprove this statement, that wherever it is sold, Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline powers more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment than any other brand. Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline has become the most outstandingly successful and fastest-selling gasoline in the West. It gives you more than any other gasoline, and it costs you no more. Be sure you get genuine cracked gasoline from an independent Rio Grande dealer so that you can re really enjoy the thrill of police car performance in your own car. our pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. Tonight's case shows the necessity for careful social control of the activities of maladjusted individuals. The murder, about which you will hear in a few moments, could undoubtedly have been avoided had an intelligent social system detected the already dangerous elements in the murderer's personality and sought to correct them either through psychic, therapeutics, or incarceration in an institution. The problem of law-breaking is not merely the simple matter of police controlling the crime when it occurs. It also involves sane methods for discovering criminal pos potentialities in individuals before those potentialities surge into actual criminal activity. Early in the morning of September 27, 1913, grumbling as she clatters down the still corridors of the Dillman building, Agnes Vito, scrub lady, is met by another cleaning woman. Well, devil take it, if you aren't the one to work it, why don't you stop and come along home? And it ain't my fault I'm still rustling them off after daybreak. I've got an officer clean yet. you got an officer clean? Yeah. Well, can't you get them all done during the night? During the night? Mrs. Gay's office. It was locked last night from the inside. And believe me, if it's still locked, it can just go dirty. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Gay, is it? Mm -hmm. What could she be doing or working all hours? Mm, sure, I don't know. But like I told you, the door was locked last night from the inside, and there was a light on. <sighs> now, would you look at the mess in here, Ella? You'd think Mrs. Gay would be ashamed. Now, wouldn't your papers lift it all over the place? Oh, it's plumb disgraceful. Take me a good half hour to get this place into shape. I'll stay and help you if you like. No, Ella, I'll do it myself. But believe me, I'm going to speak my mind to Mrs. Gay. Honest, I'm going to... <laughs> Ella, what? Look, there's Mrs. Gay. Heaven help us, Ella. She's covered with, with blood. <laughs> Hysterical scrub woman summons the police, and detectives Holm, Ingraham, McIntyre, and King answer the call. Having questioned Agnes Vidos, they proceed to make an inspection of the crime scene. Blood everywhere, even on the ceiling. Hmm. Here's what did the job. A length of gas pipe wrapped in manila paper. Well, apparently, she was smacked down as she sat at her desk. Yeah. Then she was dragged across the room to that window. The blood smears on the floor prove that. And apparently the killer tried to throw her body out the window, but couldn't quite manage it. No wonder. 
she was a pretty heavy woman. I wonder what he was after. Well, whatever it was, he sure wrecked the place. These drawers here torn open, purse open. Not very careful about hiding his identity. Left bloody fingerprints all over. Well, the thing to do, first of all, is reconstruct the background of this woman. Find out all we can about her, and maybe from that we can discover a clue. With the technique peculiar to the police, the most intimate details of the murdered woman's life are uncovered. A score of people are interviewed. The results are revealing. Mrs. Gay was in the best of health and spirits. I am sure she had no enemies. She did a fine work as a spiritual advisor to a host of people. Oh, there was none I knew that even fought harm against her. Mrs. Gay was expected at my house for dinner that night. She was to have brought the chicken. That accounts for the dress chicken you found in her office. But she telephoned at 4.30 that afternoon and said she would be unable to come. I divorced Rebecca Gay 20 years ago. I haven't seen her. I have not seen her since, and I never wanted to. Of course, I had nothing to do with this. I am Mrs. Gay's landlady. I waited for her to come home until 11 o'clock that night. Then I went to bed. But I heard the phone ring in her apartment several times during the night. Well, it was a bunch of religious fanatics who were out to get Mrs. Gay because she did so much good. They murdered her. I have an office across the hall from Mrs. Gay's. I saw a big Negro with a large bundle under his arm enter her office that afternoon. He walked with a springy step and had funny, bulging eyes. I had an appointment with Mrs. Gay that afternoon. She told me a big colored man was waiting to see her. When I left, I saw this big Negro sitting in the reception room. That's the only clue we got, boys. I want you to go out and look for a big Negro with live steps and the dilated eyes of a narcotic. I ain't no good, that's all. I ain't no good. You let me be white, man. I know what I'm doing. I'm not going to do it in my own way. I ain't no good, I tell you. Ah, well, this is Central Detectives. Hey, you better come out here to Third and Main quick. What's up? There, there's a crazy Negro down here trying to beat his head against a telephone pole. The excited Negro is overpowered by a squad of detectives and brought into headquarters. It is several hours before he is sufficiently calmed down to enable the officers to extract intelligible answers from him. Now, what's your name? Robert Askew. Yeah, where do you live? Well, I lived in a room in the house out of Gladys Avenue. What number? Seems like it's number 440. Now, what was the idea of raising the devil down there at the corner of 3rd and Main? Well, I don't know, boss. I don't remember nothing about it. Use narcotics? Because you mean dope? No, the boss. I don't even smoke Mary Warner's. Oh, do you know Mrs. Rebecca Gay? No, sir. I never done hear of her. Well, I used to know a Mr. Gay once, though. A Mr. Gay? Who? Uh, Mr. John Gay, I work for him once in San Diego. Is that home? Yeah, that's the husband of the woman. When did you work for him? Oh, I guess it must have been about three or four years ago. Hmm. Where were you on the night of September 27th? September 27th? I don't know, boss. I ain't much good at remembering dates. Uh, you better know. September 27th was a week ago tomorrow. Oh, was that a Friday night? Yes. Oh, then I guess I was over in Maybell's house. I always go over there on a Friday night. Why did you kill Mrs. Gay? Huh? What's that, boss? Why did you murder Mrs. Gay? I don't know what you're all talking about, boss. I ain't murdered no one. No, sir. I, I don't do you things like that. better confess, ask you. Every circumstance points to you. With a confession, you may get life instead of hanging. Hanging? <laughs> What you all mean, boss? I ain't done nothing. I keep after him, Holm. I'll take a couple of boys out to his house and shake it down. Okay. Now look here, ask you. It isn't going to do you any good to deny that you... A squad of officers under the leadership of Detective King swoops down on the house on Gladys Avenue. While King and Ingraham investigate the room of the suspect, the other men search the grounds and the adjoining alley for incriminating evidence. In Askew's closed closet, they find something of interest. Mm. Yeah. Look at that coat. Recently cleaned, yeah. yeah. 
They didn't do a good job on the lapels. Brown spots. Hmm. Blood? Possibly. They have to have them analyzed. There's no question about that. Hey, Lieutenant, look what I found out in the alley. Yeah. Bloody shirt. Yeah, it was right out back. Let's see it. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Here's a laundry mark. 729R. Anything in those bureau drawers, Ingram? I'll see. Yeah, here's some collars, ties. Hey, any laundry marks on those collars? Yeah. Yeah, 729R. Good. This is Askew Shirt, then. He'll have a hard time explaining this. While the officers are waiting for the hemologist's report on the stains found on the shirt and coat, Earl Rogers, a criminal attorney, drops in. Hello, Earl. Hello, Ed. What brings you down here? Mm, curiosity. Uh, about what? About that Mrs. Gay murder. The case interests me. What's new on it? Oh, well, we've got a suspect arrested. <clears throat> We're waiting right now for the report on some stains we found on some of his clothing. Well, who is the fellow? Oh, big Negro boy. Used to work for Mrs. Gay's divorced husband. No question about him being guilty. Just a matter of piling up enough evidence. And, and unless I miss my guess, here's the evidence now. Well, Doctor? Yeah, well, unquestionably, the spots on his shirt and coat were made by human blood. Fine. That settles it. Mind if I look at this coat a minute, Ed? No, go ahead. Thanks a lot, Doctor, for your quick reply on this thing. That boy's as good as convicted right now. Yeah, not at all. Glad to be able to help you. Say, Ed, just because these stains are human blood isn't enough to convict a man. Well, it'll be enough for us. Not if I was defending him. I'd get him off. Say, Earl, are you trying to tell me my business? Mm, not exactly, but here's something I think you overlooked, and you might need it. Oh, what is it? A gray hair under the lapel of this coat. Yeah? Let me see it. Well, there's no doubt about it now. Oh, yes, there is. Maybe the hair was left there by a gray cat. You better have Dr. Ethel Leonard, that woman bacteriologist, compare it with a hair from the dead woman's scalp before you jump at any conclusions. Attorney Rogers, more deeply interested than ever, is on hand when the bacteriologist makes her report. I find, Lieutenant King, that the hair from the head of the dead woman and that taken from the coat of the Negro are the same in color, size, and texture. Then there's no question about the hair on his coat coming from her head? No, I don't say that, Lieutenant. I can't be positive about it. All I can say is that they are similar in color, size, and texture. Well, that'll be enough to send him up. I wouldn't be too sure about that, Ed. I could beat it. Yeah? Well, he can't. And you can't beat it for him. Because I'm going to get a confession from him right now. Mind if I come along? No, come ahead. But <laughs> none of this soliciting of business. I promise just to sit and listen. All right, now, I'll ask you. Are you ready to talk? I ain't got nothing to say, boss. Why did you murder Mrs. Gay? I never murdered no one, boss. I swear. Listen, I'll ask you. I told you we'd get the stuff on you, and we've got it. Now, I'll give you one more chance to confess and make it easy on yourself. I ain't got nothing to confess, boss. Listen, ask you. We found a blood-stained shirt in the alley back of your house. How do you explain that? Well, I got into a fight and the other fellow got blooded up. And that we boss. found a gray hair on your coat. A gray hair that is the same in color, size, and texture as the hair on Mrs. Gay's scalp. How do you explain that? I, I, I don't know, boss. I, I ain't very good at explaining things, but... Well, you've got a blonde hair on your coat. How do you explain that? That's neither here nor there. Yeah, yeah, but people does pick up hairs, boss. Why did you kill Mrs. Gay? I didn't kill her and nobody else. Why were you beating your head against the telephone pole when we arrested you yesterday? Well, I, I was licking up, that's all. Well, it's my head, ain't it? Yes, but it's the city's telephone pole. Well, listen, you promised to keep out of this, sir. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Oh, well, don't forget again. I'm going to get the truth from this boy, or I'll know the reason why. If you why. let this poor kid alone, Ed, I'll tell you a few things that might help. What do you mean? Say, have you been holding out on me? No, I've just been keeping my ears open and working a hunch. Now I'm ready to talk. Okay, go ahead. Send the kid back to his cell. Listen, what the devil is this? Are you running this investigation or am I? I suppose you are. Well, then kindly stop giving orders. You got me wrong, Ed. I'm not giving orders. I just want to see this kid get a break. I don't think he's guilty of a thing more serious than getting drunk. What? You see, boss, what i will tell you... Quiet, ask you. Now, what's the idea of making a crack like that, Earl? I'll tell you if you'll send the kid back to his cell and let him get a little sleep. All right. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, take the prisoner back to his cell. Yes, sir. Come on. Man. You see, boss, you see I'm innocent. Now, what's the big idea of upsetting this investigation, Earl? Upsetting it? I'm not upsetting anything. I'm trying to help you. All right, go ahead. Listen, you've got a pretty nice circumstantial case against this Askew boy. 
But I've got a hunch you're all wrong. Maybe he did do it. And maybe instead he's telling the truth. And he got into a fight and bloodied up the other guy. And he picked up gray hairs any place. After all, hairs can only be classified. They're not like fingerprints. All right, granting all that. Now, what's your angle? I just happened to think about a case I heard had a year or so ago. I defended a Negro in a murder case that was similar in many respects to this Mrs. Gay killing. You've just been telling me that hair identification isn't positive. And now you're trying to pin this murder on someone who did a similar job a year ago. Now, wait a minute. Keep your shirt on. Oh. This fellow, Burr Harris, was accused of beating a woman to death in Compton. Yes. The modus operandi was identical. Oh, no. The murder was a... Weapon was a length of pipe wrapped in manila paper and so on. I defended him and he beat the rap when his mother established an alibi for him. I remember that case. That fellow should have gone up. Of course he should. But the old lady's alibi sold the jury. They let him off. And uh, you think he might have pulled this one? There's a mighty good chance of it. In any case, I'm sure this ask kid you have in here had nothing to do with it. You know where Harris lives? Yeah, if he hasn't moved. Let's go out and have a talk with him. <laughs> Well, this is the place, all right, but whether he still lives here is another matter. Somebody's here. That's the thing. What you all want? Oh, remember me, Mrs. Harris? Oh, you always a lawyer, fella. That's right. What you all want now? Bird done paid you all. Oh, I'm not worried about that. I want to talk to Burr. Is he in? No, he ain't in. Who's this fella with you? He looks like a policeman. Well, to tell the truth, Mrs. Harris, he is. This is Lieutenant King. I'm glad to know you, ma'am. Well, I am glad to know you. My boy ain't done nothing. He ain't even in Los Angeles. He ain't been here since the 27th of September. 27th of September, that checks. Where did he go on the 27th of September, Mrs. Harris? He done went to San Diego. Uh, what did he do the 26th of September, Mrs. Harris? Well, for I got to tell you. You see, Lieutenant King here suspects your son of something. Why, and I want him to hear from your lips how wrong he is. Suspecting what? Oh, just a trivial little matter, nothing important. Now, if you'll just answer the officer's questions, Mrs. Harris. Uh, what did your son do on the 26th of September, ma'am? Uh, that, that is the day before he went away. Well, he, he was home all morning. And then he went out about noon, and he come back about 9 o'clock in the night. And then he packs up the next morning and goes away without saying a word. And when he gets to San Diego, he sends me a telegram. That's where he is. Uh, where is he staying? At a San Philly's hotel, last I hear but he ain't done nothing. He's innocent. He's innocent of anything. That boy of mine, he's a good boy. Yes, Mrs. Harris, I'm sure he is. King immediately requests the assistance of San Diego police in locating Burr Harris. Chief J. Keno Wilson of the San Diego Police Department details an officer to the San Police Hotel. Got any Negroes registered here? Oh, uh, uh, no, there's no Negro here now, sir. Uh, when was there any? Oh, I had a Negro fellow in here on the uh, uh, yesterday, sir. Name wasn't Harris by any chance? Yes, sir. Harris. Where'd he go? Oh, I think he say uh, he go uh, Tijuana. Okay, I'll talk to the Border Patrol. The San Diego officer speeds south to the Mexican border. He interviews the officers at the international line. Boys, I'm looking for a Negro named Burr Harris. He's over six feet tall and walks with a springy step. Supposed to have crossed over the line within the last 24 hours. Have you seen him? Yeah, seems to me I did. Uh, remember that guy came through just before we closed the gate last night, Sam? Yeah, that description sure sounds like him. No way of luring him back on this side of the line for me, is there? Uh, don't see how. About all we can do is notify the stations along the line to look for him. Let you know if he crosses back onto this side. Well, do that for me, will you? This guy's wanted for murder up in L.A. Okay, we'll keep our eyes open for him. Several days go by. And then on October 6th, Chief Wilson receives a tip from the Border Patrol that Harris has crossed back into the United States and is headed for San Diego. The chief throws a squad of men around the San Feliz Hotel, and a couple of hours later, when Harris enters the lobby... All right, Harris, take him up. Huh? Before, before you want me to stick him up. You're under arrest for the murder of Mrs. Rebecca Gay in Los Angeles. <laughs> Say, white man, you must be crazy. I don't know no Mrs. Rebecca Gay. I ain't murdered no one. Los Angeles police want to talk to you about it. Say, I've been down here in Dago for a month. I ain't murdered nobody. <laughs> you ask my mom. She's got letters and telegrams prove I've been here for a month. Right out of your mark and get you out of this rap, Harris. Chances are the Los Angeles police have got so much on you this time, you think you'll take a one-way ride to the birdcage at Trenton. Boy, you got a big surprise coming, because I didn't kill nobody, no how. Coolly defiant, Burr Harris is locked in a cell in the San Diego jail. 
But as the hours of night advance, Burr Harris, like a trapped jungle animal, paces the narrow confines of the steel barred room, muttering to himself. Oh, Lord, he's muttering. I shall not walk. He maketh me to lie down in green pasture. He maketh me to lie down in green pasture. He maketh me to lie down. Oh, now I lie me down to sleep. I can't sleep till kingdom come. Oh, thy will be done on earth, Lord, as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth. Thy will be done. I will be done. I will be done on her, Lord. Be quiet. These other men want to sleep. Oh, Mr. Gator. Oh, Mr. I've seen ghosts. I've just seen green ghosts with purple robes coming through that window, and I, I'm scared to. I'm just powerful scared, Mr. Gator. Well, there's nothing to be scared of. We don't keep ghosts in this oh, jail. Oh, the same, so I am scared. I was afraid to spend the night in this cell alone. Sir. Oh, won't you just come and sit by me, please, Mr. Taylor? Just let me talk to you. The ghosts, they're scared of your gun. They won't bother me none, then. Oh, you come and talk to me, please, sir. <laughs> to lead the prisoner into a confession, the prisoner weaving a complicated yarn of his activities of the past month. When morning comes, the jailer reports all he has learned to the chief, and the story is immediately checked, point for point. The results are presented to Harris that afternoon. Pretty neat game you tried to play last night, Harris. What do you mean, sir? I ain't playing no game. Oh, yes, you were. Hand that a lot of baloney to that jailer about what you've been doing in San Diego the past month. So we checked on everything about you, and we found that everything you said is a lie. Well, I don't tell no lies, sir. No, sir. I tell the truth, first, last, and always. Okay, listen to this. Mrs. Rebecca Gabe was murdered on September the 27th. On the 28th, you registered at the San Police Hotel. We got a copy of the wire you sent to your mother when you arrived in San Diego that day. They've got the record from the Santa Fe showing they sold you a ticket from L.A. that day. We know every move you made. We know that you didn't arrive here in San Diego until the day after Mrs. Gabe was murdered. Now, as to the day of the murder, you answer the description of the murderer and undoubtedly will be identified by those women who saw you in Mrs. Gabe's office when you get back to L.A., we were accused of a similar murder a year ago. The murder of Mrs. Haskins in Compton. A murder committed with a length of gas pipe wrapped in a manila paper, just as the murder of Mrs. Gay was committed. We're going to send you to the gallows for that job as sure as you're an inch high. Now, what do you got to say? Uh, I, I got a man to torment, sir. It's powerful, man. No, don't change the subject. I ain't changing the subject, sir. My, my torment's part of it. Why did you kill Mrs. Gay? Because I, I got the torment. The only way I can get relief from it is to is to kill somebody. Oh, so you admit it then? Sure. I guess I'd be better off dead than suffering the torment and going around killing people to, to get relief from it. Yes, sir. I killed Miss Gay, all right. I hit over the head with a gas pipe. Then I tried to push her out of the window, but she was too heavy. Yes, sir. I, I killed Miss Haskins in Compton, too. My mother lied to save me. And I set fire to the Coronado Hotel in Los Angeles in 1905 by putting a bomb under the building. In 1906, I, I sent a bomb to Mrs. Pierce, who run the hotel. In 1907, I, I sent a box of poison candy to Mrs. Pierce's children. What'd you do that for? Well, I, I used to work at the hotel, and they, they held up my pay once, and I, I never forgot it. What'd you have against Mrs. Gay? Nothing. I never saw her before I walked into her office. I just got to Tom in bed that day, sir, and I, I had to kill. So I just walked in and killed her. That's all. Harris was charged with murder. But on this second trial, Earl Rogers did not defend him. He did, however, utter an opinion on the strange, brooding Negro killer. Whatever it is worth, it is at least interesting to note that every one of Harris's crimes were committed in the month of September. He fired the hotel in September 1905. He sent the bomb in uh, September 1906. He sent the poison candy in September 1907, and he murdered Mrs. Haskin in September 1911. And he murdered Mrs. Gay in September 1913. His degeneracy takes the form of sending him back three or four thousand years. When undergoing a spell, he's a jungle man again. 
The instincts of the caveman control him then. He walks the thoroughfares of civilized communities with his mind thousands of years back in the jungles. jungle law in the end is the law of civilized nations, too. The survival of the fittest, the eternal law of compensation. It took its toll on Burr Harris. He answered for his crimes to the fullest extent at the extreme end of a taunt manila rope in the execution chamber at San Quentin Penitentiary. Askew, the original suspect who attempted to bat himself to death against a telegraph pole, was indeed innocent and was promptly released upon Harris' confession. Thank you, Chief Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever it is sold, Rio Grande de Cracked is the chosen gasoline for the finest, fastest cars on the highways today. The fire engines, the ambulances, the high-powered police cars that prowl the streets 24 hours a day, leaping from a crawl to a mile-a-minute speed when emergencies arrive. Such cars need the finest gasoline money can buy. Yet they use the same Rio Grande de Cracked gasoline that you get from your neighborhood service station. No finer gasoline has yet been made. When you drive in for a tank full of Rio Grande Cracked, be sure to get the latest copy of the Calling All Cars News. This fascinating publication with its true crime stories and movie news is absolutely free, and half a million motorists ask for the Calling All Cars News every month. In this free publication, you'll read how Rio Grande is equipping an army of thousands of boys and girls with complete detective outfits, all free. You can help outfit some boy or girl at no cost to you, Ask your Rio Grande dealer for the best motor oil he has, and he'll tell you that Sinclair motor oils are the world's finest. Yet a quart of Sinclair motor oil in refinery seal can costs as little as 25 cents. Only because Sinclair is one of the world's leading manufacturers of lubricants with worldwide sales volume can you get such top quality motor oil at such low price. Rio Grande is proud to recommend Sinclair motor oil. Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 148 regarding a murder. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Rolls and quit. Narrator Frederick Lindsley.